his status until such time as he was discovered, eventually racking up $10,642.67 in fees which benefit the Premier. Therefore, to resolve, the Premier did use thousands of dollars out of the pockets of taxpayers over the course of many years in order that the Premier could retain his own status and that the member for Anakinish urged the Premier to apologize to all Nova Scotians for using their money to his benefit. Mr. Speaker, I'd ask for a waiver of notice and pass it to the debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? I hear several no's. The motion is tabled. Orders of the day, oral questions put by members to ministers. The time is now 4 11. We will finish at 5.41, if my math is correct. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question, my question is for the Premier. Just moments ago, evidence filed on behalf of the consumer advocate and small business advocate and the maritime link uh, experts in the field, recognized world experts in the field, stated, quote, or in, into a question of are you satisfied the Maritime Link project is the lowest cost long-term alternative for electricity ratepayers in Nova Scotia? The answer was no. We are, sat we are satisfied that the Maritime Link imports are consistent with the obligations under the Electricity and Under Environment Act. We believe that the applicant has not demonstrated that the Maritime Link project represents the lowest cost alternative for the ratepayers of the province. And based on our detailed review of the applicant's economic analysis of the Maritime Link project versus alternatives, we conclude that the applicant's analysis was faulty, lacking in robustness, incompletely documented, and biased to favour the applicant's outcome. Oh. Mr. Speaker, would the Premier like to explain that? Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I have, have not seen what has been uh, filed, but I can tell you this. John Dalton uh, is a world-renowned expert, uh, uh, respected across uh, jurisdictions, who has done a detailed minute-by-minute uh, -minute analysis of what it will save, uh, what it will save ratepayers in this province, almost a half a billion dollars less over over its nearest competitor that are real savings into the pockets of the people of Nova Scotia. That I know. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier should be careful what he says because these three international experts agree. And let me continue. They say the applicant has based their assertion on very small, perhaps insignificant differences between two large numbers. We conclude that indigenous wind alternatives and a variant of the other import alternative are less expensive than the Maritime Link in all, Mr. Speaker, less expensive in all of the cases that we tested. Moreover, Moreover, the indigenous wind and other import alternatives have the added benefits of flexibility, diversity, and scalable capital outlay. A large long-term ironclad financial commitment to the Maritime Link will preclude the province's ability to react and respond to future changes in load, technical progress, evolve, and evolving environmental goals. Mr. Speaker, let's hear the Premier respond to that. Honourable the Premier. Mr. Mr. Speaker, it, is, it has never been clearer than it is today that the Liberal Party stands against Atlantic Canada, stands against progress on, on, on real fairness in electricity rates. They don't, want, they don't want to have the Maritime Link go forward. They don't want to endorse Atlantic Canadian strategy for the lowest and fairest electricity rates, Mr. Speaker. The, the Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his final supplementary. You're the only person in this room who is against, against domestic energy is this Premier because this three, three experts, three experts Experts have said that wind in Nova Scotia would be cheaper than Maritime Link. Three experts have said that other imports would be cheaper than Maritime Link. And Mr. Speaker, the final quote in this which I've tabled says, quote, the Maritime Link transaction short changes Nova Scotia ratepayers in at least two ways. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier now agree to lengthen the review process as the interveners asked for and admit that he's failed? Oh. 
Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the Maritime Link project will provide the lowest, fairest rates for Nova Scotians. Instead, the Liberal Party of Nova Scotia would rather put the fate of Atlantic Canada in the hands of Quebec Hydro. They would rather sell out the security, the security of Atlantic Canada to one of the largest monopolies in the world, order. Mr. Speaker. Order, order. I think when the Speaker says order, I think that means order in this chamber. And I'll remind all members in the House on all sides of the House. I will now recognize the Honourable Premier for his answer. Mr. Speaker, the Utility and Review Board will review all of the experts, including Mr. Dalton and including any other reports that come forward. I am confident that the Maritime Link will display the lowest, fairest rates. It will support an Atlantic Canadian strategy. And unlike the Liberal Party, it will not endorse this wholesale the wholesale, uh, uh, the, the, the wholesale, the wholesale de destruction of an Atlantic Canadian alternative for the benefit of Hydro Quebec. Yeah. The honourable leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one year has passed since the tragic uh, death in Halifax of Raymond Tavelle. This anniversary reminds us that it only takes one tragedy to demand real change to protect the public. And when that demand comes, the need is urgent, Mr. Speaker. The joint review of the East Coast Forensic Hospital Community Access Privileges was completed last year as a result of the tragic murder of Raymond Tevel. And I have the update uh, from the, uh, that report with me, which I will table, Mr. Speaker. There were 18 recommendations made last year. Uh, so far, the government has acted a year later on less than half of them. In light of the urgency of the situation, Mr. Speaker, I'll ask the Premier, why is he allowed an entire year to go by with so little to show for it? Honourable the Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, action is underway on all of the recommendations. Uh, some have been completed. We are looking forward to have the rest of them, uh, the rest of them dealt with. This is a very Im uh, important uh, issue and a very important question, and I'd like uh, to have the Minister of Health fill in the leader of the Conservative Party further uh, on the work that has taken place to date. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot of people working in different departments to ensure the recommendations, the 18 recommendations, that we will fully implement all of them, Mr. Speaker. We've committed uh, to a timetable. We just updated uh, for Nova Scotians. It's on the website. They can see the updates and where we're at with the 18 recommendations. And it's our hope uh, that we'll have all 18 recommendations uh, implemented uh, around September of this year. I think that's a really aggressive uh, timeline. Line, Mr. Speaker, and we've worked across jurisdictions, across departments to ensure that we address the issues that Nova Scotians want us to address and the issues that were in the recommendations from the report. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, let me remind you of this government's history on meeting its own timelines. That joint review was supposed to be a 30-day review in urgent response to the murder of Raymond Tevel. It took the government seven months to complete the review, and it contains 18 specific recommendations. And I'd like to remind the Premier, studying a recommendation is not actually adopting the recommendation that should not be counted as such. This is a matter of urgent public safety. How can the people of Nova Scotia ever take the government seriously when they respond to these tragedies in such a lackadaisical manner? Mr. Speaker, so I will ask the Premier, will he get serious about the need to keep Nova Scotians safe, to protect them on our streets, and adopt today all of the recommendations and put them in place from the Joint Review Panel? Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, um, I'm not sure that um, the leader of the Conservative Party was actually paying attention to what went on. I mean, this were external. This was external, or an external review uh, by experts who brought forward recommendations, which we are implementing. And I would uh, ask the Minister of Health to explain further uh, the manner in which we are acting in order to implement uh, these um, uh, these recommendations uh, for the benefit of all Nova Scotians. 
The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said in my initial uh, comments to the member opposite, uh, I think everybody in this House recognizes the importance of, of ensuring that there's uh, public safety when it comes to those individuals who find themselves at the forensic unit. Mr. Speaker, I recently took a tour uh, to get an additional update on how we're doing within uh, the facility itself. Uh, so those recommendations that deal with the facilities are being implemented. One of them, of course, was the uh, access to a smoking area within the facility. Uh, that should be operational within days. Uh, I was just over there a couple of weeks ago seeing that, Mr. Speaker. We're working with Justice. The Minister of Justice is working with uh, federal counterparts to ensure that all the changes through the Justice uh, Department and, and the justice system needs to take place. These are uh, important changes that need to take place. They do take some time, and I think we've uh, acted quite reasonably and quickly on the 18 recommendations. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you who's paying very close attention. That is the Tavel family themselves, the family that was stricken by tragedy. Mr. Speaker, and so are all Nova Scotians paying attention when tragedy occurs and they look to the government to provide a strong and immediate response. Mr. Speaker, it is not good enough for the government to sit idly by and study proven recommendations for months and months at a time when the safety both of the uh, typical Nova Scotians who are walking our streets is at risk and even the safety of those patients of the East Coast Forensic Centre. Mr. Speaker, they all need action. So I will ask the Premier, how can all of those people, including all Nova Scotians, take his government seriously about its efforts to promote safety when they take forever to implement important recommendations like those in the joint review? Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I guess we have a, a different definition of ever or forever because, you know, the Conservatives were in government for 10 years and they did nothing on this forever. In fact, for the entire time of their government, they did nothing on this whatsoever. Mr. Speaker, it was this government that, that appointed the expert panel, that got the recommendations, that are implementing it. I, I'm going to ask the Minister of Health to further explain, and, and including the fact that he, he met with the Tavel family to go over the, uh, the recommendations, Mr. Speaker, because the fact of the matter is that we take the responsibility of this for, uh, for this seriously. We developed the recommendations, and we're implementing them. The Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to assure all Nova Scotians, and especially the Tavel family and those uh, individuals who care deeply for, for Raymond, uh, we recognize uh, the anniversary of his death today, a, a tragedy for not only his family and those who loved him, but the, the community and the province, Mr. Speaker. The Justice Minister and myself met with the representatives who represent the Tavel family recently so that we could update them on our progress. We've committed to them, we've committed to the public that we would be very transparent and open. That's why the update is on our website right now, Mr. Speaker, for all Nova Scotians to see how quickly we're moving to implement all these recommendations. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday... Mr. Speaker, yesterday outside of the chamber, the Premier spoke about reducing wait times, Mr. Speaker, from well over a year to four months. While this is admirable, Mr. Speaker, the problem is the Premier was talking about reducing wait times for assessments and not wait times for actual programs, which may be required as a result of this assessment, Mr. Speaker. So again, my question to the Premier, why is the government content with the record of moving youth and children from one wait list only to have them languish on another? Yeah. Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're not satisfied at all. In fact, we're not satisfied uh, with the manner in which uh, these uh, uh, mental health in this province has been um, uh, handled for many, many, many years. And that is why uh, this government chose to bring in the mental health strategy. Not only did we go out, consult with the stakeholders, you know, talk to uh, organizations around the province who until now have been handed the responsibility for uh, assisting uh, in the field of mental health, but, but have done so without the proper funding. We, we brought in the strategy and we brought in the funding to implement the strategy, Mr. Speaker. So, are we satisfied? 
Absolutely not. Are we moving uh, towards having an efficient and effective system, one that will address the mental health needs of Nova Scotians? Yes, Mr. Speaker, we are. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, that is funding that they've underspent while they were handing out records amount of corporate welfare, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on May 12th, on May 12th, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal health critic informed this government that the IWK Act program were no longer doing pre-admissions due to the fact that those coming into the program would have to wait until the fall or winter of 2013 before, before they could actually access the program. The IWK 24-7 Choices program for youth and adolescents has grown to the point where 9 out of 10 patients are now waiting 61 days to access that program, Mr. Speaker, compared to only 20 one year ago. My question to the Premier, why did the Premier selectively choose to focus on assessment wait times when it's critical that youth actually have access to programs? Honourable the Premier. Well, uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I don't want the leader of the uh, opposition to inadvertently mislead the House. No money was uh, underspent with respect to mental health. Um, the mental health strategy came into May. The, the budget was 5.2, so it was prorated over the year, so the full amount of the budget was, uh, was spent, as it will be this year, in order to make sure that we have the most effective programming possible. What I would point out to the Leader of the Opposition that is that before someone can get into a program, they actually have to have an assessment. So pulling down the assessment wait times, of course, is a good thing. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I hope the Premier realizes how ridiculous that statement sounds to families, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, some, Mr. Speaker, somehow by pulling down an assessment and telling families who already know that the young people in their family need help, Mr. Speaker, by somehow telling them that magically created assessment is going to make everything better without putting them into treatment is absolutely ridiculous and offensive to families across this province, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on May 17, 2012, the Minister of Health and Wellness stood in her place and indicated she would be posting wait times as they related to the mental health standards. Well, almost a year later, those wait times are still not available for the public to see. So my question to the Premier, could the Premier please tell us why, after one year, Nova Scotians are still unable to see the wait times that are related to the mental health standards? Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, what is now clear is the extraordinary lack of judgment of the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, the, the assessment tools that are put in place in order to assess people for the kind of treatment they need is absolutely critical in their treatment. In fact, nothing else, nothing else can happen until the assessment takes place. For the Leader of the Opposition uh, in this House to suggest that the assessments are unnecessary uh, is, in fact, ridiculous. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a new question. Speaker, one more time, the Premier distorts anything that's been said in this House. Mr. Speaker, last year, Mr. Speaker, last year the NDP government made an unprecedented interference into what was supposed to be the ind independent process to redraw the electoral boundaries of this province. From the outset, and from every step of the way, the Premier, through his actions and the actions of his government, discredited this important process. After losing their representation, the Acadian Federation of Nova Scotia is now asking the Premier to send the question of constitutionality to the Supreme Court as a reference case. My question to the Premier, will the Premier send this question to the Supreme Court for an independent analysis of the constitutionality of removing minority ridings? Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, in fact, uh, the terms of reference support minority representation. They, in fact, support uh, a, a drawing of boundaries that, that recognizes the very important uh, cultural history of our province. Uh, we, uh, we, I believe uh, that uh, there is uh, uh, a, uh, a, a report that uh, was done independently. We did not interfere with it. In fact, we simply support the recommendations that come forward, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, the answer of, a re of the, with respect to the reference, is no. We will not. The honourable leader of the official opposition on his first supplementary, Mr. Speaker, the request from the federation should come as no surprise to the premier. Acadians from across the province have been disappointed by the political interference from this premier during the whole process. The Premier's interference resulted in the elimination of the Katie ridings. 
So my question to the Premier, why is the Premier refusing clarification from the Supreme Court on whether the elimination of the Acadian ridings is even constitutional? Honourable the Premier. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have no idea what the Leader of the Opposition is talking about. The fact of the matter is those ridings are still there. The, the, the boundaries have changed, Mr. Speaker, uh, as they must. Uh, they now fit into the 25% uh, uh, variation, which they should, which they should do, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and and uh, the member for Richmond is quite fair. I have absolutely nothing to fair. We support the we we support the constitutionality the constitutionality of this. And uh, Mr. Speaker, if uh, if uh, the uh, member for Richmond wants to support that challenge, uh, he has the capacity. He could do it himself. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. One thing is clear. It was wrong for the Premier to interfere and politicize the redistribution of Nova Scotia Ride. Speaker, Nova Scotia had an independent process with all party support until the Premier took action to ensure that the Acadian ridings were eliminated. This Premier has cast doubt on the independence of this process, Mr. Speaker, and, the, and has cast doubt on the outcomes, Mr. Speaker, of that independent panel in the eyes of Nova Scotians. So my question to the Premier, why is the Premier afraid of referring the question to the Supreme Court of constitutionality of eliminating minority electoral rights in the province of Nova Scotia? Honourable the Premier. Uh, to be, uh, to be perfectly clear, Mr. Speaker, uh, there was no interference with the Electoral Commission, none whatsoever. In fact, they were simply asked to produce a report that conformed to the uh, terms of reference which they were handed by the House of Assembly. Mr. Speaker, that's what they were. And you can ask anybody, and they, and they will say that that is what they did, Mr. Speaker. There was no ridings were done away with. Uh, in fact, the ridings still exist, and they now conform to what is the constitutionally mandated uh, 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 scale or deviation with respect to uh, ridings, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of EDRDT. Um, today, the NDP government uh, has realized, I think, at the 11th hour, that the economy of southwestern Nova Scotia is in the dumps and creates yet another committee to help improve tourism in the southwest region. All this means, all this means, or possibly means, is that another level of bureaucracy has been created. In 2011, the same minister announced the formation of a regional economic council for the area in an attempt to make up for a disastrous decision to cancel the Yarmouth Ferry, which did nothing but really create confusion. So my question to the minister, will the minister admit that this new committee is just window dressing and that will do nothing to improve the economic situation in southwestern Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I, was, uh, I was in Yarmouth uh, this morning, early this morning. We made the announcement with respect to the, uh, uh, the, the team uh, that, that we put together down there. And one of the things I spoke about was the dedication, the commitment, and the passion of not only the members uh, of this, uh, of the team that we put together in uh, in Yarmouth, but also about the uh, people in Yarmouth in general, and I will say this is, uh, uh, I have uh, great confidence and faith uh, in the membership and leadership of that team uh, that's been put together in uh, in Yarmouth and the entire region. The uh, member opposite may not have the same faith. Uh, in belief in those members that I do, but I certainly believe in the leadership. The Honourable Member for Argyle on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I have faith in the members. I don't have any faith in that government. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the government will be providing $1 million to this new team on top of previous NDP handouts and bailouts to support similar teams and agencies over the year. In 2011, they gave a million dollars to the owners of the Rod Grant Hotel, $250,000 to support the World Junior A Hockey Challenge, but there has been no details 
no details released as to what this new team is really going to be doing. How will they operate? If they're even eligible for marketing funds through the Regional Tourism Industry Association. So will the minister, maybe, 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 maybe show me wrong, will the minister explain how this investment will benefit southwestern Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, my interpretation of what the uh, member opposite has says is that uh, we shouldn't have made that investment in the right, uh, uh, in the right hotel. Uh, what I'm hearing the member uh, say, uh, um, Mr. Speaker, is that we shouldn't have made that investment in the uh, hockey challenge that, uh, uh, that Yarmouth hosted, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what I'm hearing the member say is he has no confidence in the membership and the, uh, the citizenship of, uh, of Southwest Nova Scotia, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, as minister in this government, we do. The Honourable Member for Argyle on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, for once, I just want that minister to prove me wrong. I want him to prove to me that that investment, the million dollars that's going to be going to that group, will be used correctly to create real jobs in southwestern Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, if the member does that, and I'll, I'll thank him for it, I will thank him on the floor of this House, if it makes a true difference to the jobs and to the lives of people in southwestern Nova Scotia. Again, I have faith with the people that he has nominated to it. I have faith in the people of Yarmouth and southwestern Nova Scotia. Again, I don't have any faith in that government. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister finally admit that he hasn't got a clue on how to help my area and that he finally found somebody who does? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what I will say uh, through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the mem member opposite, uh, get out of the way. Let the people in Southwest Nova Scotia do their job. Let them work. Let them work with the stakeholders. And you know what? We will make a difference. The honourable member for Yarmouth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in response to uh, the minister's announcement today, starting a new team in uh, southwestern Nova Scotia to bring people in, attract uh, tourists, and, uh, and help stimulate our economy. This is, this is after um, we, this government has put uh, three other teams in place, uh, Team West, Team Southwest, Task Force Southwest. We also have the Yarmouth and Acadian uh, Shores Tourism Association, Southwest, uh, Destination Southwest Tourism Association. We also have an economic development uh, committee that's been put in place in Yarmouth. Uh, it all has been in response uh, to the damage that, to the economy that this government uh, did when they, when they cut the ferry. But my question in particular with this team, uh, where we have all these other groups that have been in place, um, how does this team's mandate differ from those other groups, and how do we ensure that there's no overlap in the work that's being done? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, the team that we put together uh, with, the, uh, with the good help of uh, many people in southwest Nova Scotia is, is a very strong team. They will be in our uh, the cooperation and the working spirit uh, that I certainly witnessed this morning uh, to work with uh, Destination Southwest is unbelievable. The passion that was demonstrated this morning, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it was one of those uh, meetings uh, you had to be there to, uh, to actually uh, to witness it. And I've got all the confidence in the world, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, into the membership of the uh, panel. I've got all the confidence uh, in the world, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the, uh, in the, 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 the proactivity that will be not only discriminated, discriminated, I'm having trouble with that word, demonstrated, demonstrated by the, uh, by the uh, panel, but also by the good people that live in the region. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and again, this, this isn't a question around the uh, capabilities or leadership of the individuals that have been put on that, uh, that committee. Um, uh, I, have full, I have full faith in them as well. Uh, and there's some movers and shakers on there. But my question is around uh, overlap of work 
and, uh, and how this committee's mandate differs from all the other ones that this government has put in place. Uh, specifically with the million dollars that has been allocated, Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering how precisely that money is going to be allocated. Is that money uh, able to be spent by the committee? Is it covering the administrative costs of that committee? Is it being used to market uh, southwestern Nova Scotia as a destination? Or is it going to be used to hold up uh, the tourism infrastructure that we're, that we're losing order, because of the please, loss order. of... Sergeant of Arms, could I have you remove the uh, Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage's cell phone, please? Right there on your desk in front of you. <laughs> Hand it over to him. Thank you. Are you the honourable member for Yarmouth? Uh, I, uh, just again, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the question is, how is that that million dollars going to be allocated uh, specifically? And is there anything that we're going to be able to use to hold up that tourism uh, infrastructure that we are losing since the government cut the ferry in the first place. It was in your hand. The Honourable Mem Minister for Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, part of the role of the, uh, of the panel uh, that's been uh, put together in southwest Nova Scotia is to enhance that tourism experience. Part of that, uh, part of that money, a small, a small sum of that money, uh, up to $100,000, uh, will be uh, going towards uh, the administration and support costs to help support the panel. They will be working to enhance the tourism experience. They will be working for the entire region of the Southwest Nova Scotia. They haven't had their first meeting, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, they will have their meeting. They will produce results. I have the utmost confidence in the panel. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth on his final supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, we all have faith in that panel. The issue is that it's like the sixth or seventh group that we've had look at this issue, look at the economic challenges of southwestern Nova Scotia. If you look at the money that's been put into these groups uh, and the money that was given to the grant to cover the losses uh, because of the, the government's decision to cut the ferry, you're getting to about $3 million anyway. You know, if you'd applied that $3 million three years ago to keep the ferry service going for, other, for another year, we wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. So my last question, Mr. Speaker, is around uh, the return of the Armut Ferry because it is at the very uh, core of the issue here and the economic challenges that we're facing, some of them at least. So now that the minister has reopened the RFP process along with this other group uh, to support tourism, uh, when can we expect a ferry back in Yarmouth Harbor? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, over the, uh, the three, uh, three years and uh, X number of months that uh, we've been in government, we've made significant, significant investments in southwest Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what I keep hearing habitually from the, from the opposition party is that we shouldn't have made those investments. I keep, uh, I, I, keep, I, keep hearing, I keep hearing referrals, I keep hearing referrals to ride and uh, the, the, a million dollar investment in the ride and the member is saying that they shouldn't have, we shouldn't have made that investment. We have made good investments in, the, in, the, in southwest Nova Scotia. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the member who represents Yarmouth it's almost like he's saying we should have thrown in the towel for Southwest Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. But not this minister and not this government. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Justice. A year has passed since Raymond Tavill's tragic death. We must ensure that no other family has to endure such loss. Less than half of the recommendations from the report on community access at the East Coast Forensic Hospital have been implemented. The 10 incomplete measures largely focus on what needs to be done before someone is granted unescorted leave. Will the Minister consider using GPS ankle bracelets to monitor and protect both patients and the public while patients are on unescorted leave? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, the uh, work being done in this issue, uh, I'm going to pass that over to the Minister 
of health to address, but I do want to extend my condolences to the Tavel family and his friends in the community in this day of remembrance. So the Minister of Health. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I know uh, that everyone wants to ensure uh, that we have the right uh, policies and procedures in place, Mr. Speaker, so we'll never see an event uh, like what happened a year ago today, Mr. Speaker. We're working extremely hard with our partners through different departments to ensure that the 18 recommendations that came out of the report will be uh, fulfilled, Mr. Speaker, relatively quickly here uh, as we move forward, Mr. Speaker. We know that uh, with the use of ankle bracelets for monitoring uh, individuals who find themselves in forensic units, Mr. Speaker, needs to have uh, more study. Uh, it's something that I think uh, jurisdictions across the world uh, have been debating and trying to find out if that's the right approach, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so we're committed to implementing all of the recommendations that come out of the report, and I look forward to implementing them uh, really soon, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Inverness on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure both ministers would agree, and I know they're both involved because it is both a justice and a health matter, but I'm sure both ministers would agree that being on the street at 2 a.m. in an environment near bars where there's alcohol and quite possibly drugs being consumed is probably not the best place for somebody who's being treated for mental illness. Now, a GPS bracelet would help medical professionals ensure patients return to the hospital when their unescorted period of leave has finished. The Minister of Health and Wellness acknowledged, and I'll table this, Mr. Speaker, um, that uh, there was room for improvements in the report and that he and the Minister of Justice would be happy to sit with the Tavel family and discuss improvements. Now, my question, I would ask the Minister of Justice again, why hasn't the Minister of Justice done the, what the Tavel family has requested and consider tracking bracelets as a practical solution to ensure that this doesn't happen to somebody else. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for that question. I just want to reiterate that, that from the justice perspective, in the 18 recommendations, there's five specific ones there that are directed at justice, which we have completed those, those requirements. As the Minister of Justice, I'm very committed uh, to safety and to making sure that our processes and systems work. I agree with the member when we talk about being out where there's drugs and booze is not a good place to be, but I do say that, uh, that our police officers do an excellent job and that on this issue here is that we're committed to fulfilling the requirements in the uh, 18 recommendations. We're focused on that and uh, I'm very pleased with the progress that we're making and we'd like it to be done tomorrow, but we realize that things take time and to get a good job done, we should do it right. <coughs> the Honourable Member for Inverness on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we feel the police are doing a good job as well, but we do feel that they need the tools to do the best job possible. And we know this is not about money because the health authority has hired a community monitor to track patients on unescorted leave. That's something that wasn't even included in the recommendations, but that is something that has happened. And uh, we also know that, uh, Mr. Speaker, that They've explored the possibility of using cell phones and pagers, and I'll table that, Mr. Speaker, to monitor patients while on leave. But, Mr. Speaker, wouldn't it be easier and more effective and less expensive to use ankle bracelets uh, than to run around the province trying to find patients or for waiting for them to call when they may not want to call from those cell phones? Uh, my question to the Minister of Justice, when will the Minister take an a action on a cost-effective practical solution like ankle bracelets to ensure patients remain, remain within reach of health care when they are on leave. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And because uh, the question is framed around the health of the individual, I'm going to pass that on to the Minister of Health. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the report does uh, talk a lot around the policies and the process in which an individual would gain access uh, to the community, Mr. Speaker. And I think uh, what we have to respect is the qualifications and the expertise that we utilize uh, to have the report done, but also the expertise, especially in the healthcare field, on how to best treat those individuals who are, not, who are found not criminally responsible and find themselves in forensic units around 
around around the country, Mr. Speaker, and in our province. So, through the recommendations, there are a number of key initiatives that will clarify uh, how and when an individual gains access or more access to a community, and I have confidence that those uh, changes in those pr uh, pr um, policies, Mr. Speaker, will will ensure that the the public is at, is safe but also ensuring uh, that the treatment of the, an individual uh, is is also proceeding mr speaker because we realize these individuals are patients within a hospital system uh, but i have confidence that the experts that have reviewed our policies uh, have given the right recommendations and we look forward to implementing them thank you the honorable member for kings west Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, according to a recent news report, and I will table this, a woman from Digby area has had her bank account emptied and the system has left her with no recourse. According to the report, a 67-year-old woman had about $20,000 withdrawn from her account without her knowledge after a couple moved in with her. The RCMP have told her family that there would be no investigation because this woman has an intellectual disability. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Justice explain why this vulnerable person and her family have been left with no recourse to the justice system? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the question. Because this is following in the area of the senior, I'm going to pass that over to my colleague uh, within Social Services. The Honourable Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question because it, uh, it's an important question because it's a terrible situation in our society, not just in the province of Nova Scotia, but actually throughout uh, North America. And I do know that when I have attended uh, representing the Ministry of Seniors meetings with my provincial counterparts and the federal minister, this is an issue that is on our the top of our agendas because it's a very difficult issue um, and we know that and we're having discussions to see how how can we move forward and how how do you regulate the behavior of others that are totally inappropriate and how do you re regulate the, their abuse so there's the, there's many complexities to it it's very sad that we have to deal with this in in uh, our province and throughout Canada but the uh, discussions are certainly taking place to see if there's any avenues to help out individuals in these types of situations thank you mr the Speaker. honorable member for kings west on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, the family has asserted that this woman was not involved with 20,000 in money and checks, which have been left unaccounted for. They further claim a vehicle was brought by the couple who moved in with this woman and that her credit card was used in order to make prepayments. Family states that the RCMP told them there would be no investigation because, and she quoted, she wasn't capable of pressing charges. It wouldn't be admissible in court. Well, Mr. Speaker, this truly is a justice question because this lady didn't get justice. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister explain why those Nova Scotians who are most vulnerable seem to have the least amount of opportunities in the justice system? The Honourable <coughs> Minister of Justice. Once again, since the issue sur surrounding the, the senior, I'm going to give it to my colleague. The Honourable Minister responsible for seniors. I think that the important factor here, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, when, when you look at the legalities and uh, that surrounds an issue of this type, it is very complex because many of our laws come from the federal level. The other complexity is to be able to identify uh, an individual's uh, competency, and that is very tough because. The other members may not understand, but when it comes to seniors' financial abuse, what often happens is that th those who are the abusers will develop a very close relationship with the person that they're abusing. So often, number one, the abuser uh, has difficulty in identifying that they're being abused. Family members could, or people in the community. And if that individual is competent and does not have uh, somebody who has the power of attorney over them, then that individual legally has the ability to make the decision whether they, they want to prosecute or not. And that's 
that's the, the, the very complex issue that society is trying to work out, and that's the fact of, of how, how do we go forward and make changes when we're dealing with people that can be competent and seen as competent, and they are having that close relationship and do not identify that they're actually being uh, financially abused. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings West on his final supplementary. Speaker, we see all too often that those who are most marginalized or the most vulnerable in our society are the ones who face the greatest challenge in our justice system. Sadly, the family and the community members were reporting to Adult Protection Services and the RCMP while everything was taking place, but no action was taken. However, they have all been left with no way to right this alleged wrong done to them. Mr. Speaker, this is an individual case, but it speaks directly to the problems and challenges Nova Scotians face with the justice system in the province. Mr. Speaker, how many stories will it, will it take before the minister makes changes which will ensure the most vulnerable and the most marginalized Nova Scotians have the same access to the justice system as the rest? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to assure everyone that uh, that all people have access to the justice system, but on the structure of this question and the complexities of the issues surrounding this, once again, I will turn that over to my colleague who is managing that vote. The Honourable Minister Responsible for Seniors. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's very important for the members opposite to understand that maybe they don't do this, but we do talk back and forth and have discussions over these issues. But what's very important to let people know is that we actually have taken action because we have, uh, as I mentioned, I have attended meetings, many discussions have been taking place, and we actually sent th this concern to the Law Reform Commission and that was before this report uh, became public, and that was to actually to review the power of attorney law. So, yes, we, we do know this is an issue in the province, and we are a government that always takes action. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member for Cold Harbour Eastern Passage prayed around the community last year celebrating the renovation of the old seaside school to a new high school. The school did not meet the population criteria, the distance criteria, or the funding criteria. My question to the Minister of Education is, will the Minister admit that this announcement was just another empty promise and political grandstanding? The Honourable <coughs> Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and the answer to the question is no. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton North on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker. This government has been politically maneuvering influence across the province since they formed government. Your office announced this new school without knowing the true cost of it. Now the costs are known, the project has been delayed. Is the minister and her cabinet upset that another politically charged project received full financial scrutiny? Are they scared that the rest of the politically charged projects may receive similar scrutiny? The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And last April, we uh, committed uh, money to make sure that we would have a new high school in Eastern Passage, and we are working with the board uh, and the community, and uh, we will be moving forward with that project. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton North on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, that's not what the board is saying. Mr. Speaker, the minister has disappointed students, parents, communities, and the province with gut-wrenching cuts to classrooms, flip-flopping on school reviews, and yet goes forward with politically important projects without knowing the cost. My question to the minister is how many other projects do you foresee fa falling off the project list due to financial mismanagement? The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I think that there must be a misunderstanding with the member opposite. Uh, we are working with the board. I don't know which board he is uh, uh, talking about that we're not working with, and uh, we are working with the board and community. And I just want to stand here today and clarify, there will be a new high school in Eastern Passage. The Honourable Member for Richmond. Speaker. Yesterday the, yesterday, the Justice Minister indicated that police were receiving all the resources that they could want. 
Specifically, he stated that, quote, police services across Nova Scotia are adequately funded, end quote. And further, he went on to say, I quote, I want to assure the member that the police management has adequate budgets, end quote. Yet when we look at what was actually spent on contributions to municipal policing, we see that the minister has underspent these contributions by $5.5 in the last four years. Municipal police training has been underspent by over 72% in the same period, meaning that municipal police are receiving only one-third of the funds promised by the minister each year. So my question is that will the Minister for Department of Community Services explain why the Minister of Justice is underspending when it comes to police training in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. You know what it's called? It's called good management. The Honourable Member for Richmond on his first supplementary. You know, Mr. Speaker, I think some of the victims of cyberbullying and the victims who've seen photos of themselves being passed on the internet might find it interesting to be told that funding that was made available for police training has been cut and instead is now being counted as good management. Mr. Speaker, this is a very serious issue and that's why we raised it when we asked the Minister to explain why police training funding has not been increased. We know that the investigative work of police is changing every day. We need to make sure that our police have the necessary funds to keep up with this training so that their investigative techniques can be up to date. So my question again to the Minister of Justice or whoever he wants to pass it off to is why is this government not ensuring that all monies budgeted for police training actually get spent on police training? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for uh, the member for framing uh, his question in a sarcastic manner. I will rise above that and answer the question in a way. The, the, the issue here is, is that the municipal uh, policing is a municipal responsibility and the province and the Justice Department is extremely honoured and pleased to be a partner with them in providing support for training. Each department is required to develop business plans and strategic plans for the short term and long term in, de in delivering training. If the various departments have a particular need, then they should put their business case forward so that can be appropriate addressed. But I want to assure all police officers in Nova Scotia that this minister is 100% unequivocally dedicated to their support and development. And should they have a particular need or void in their training, that I am committed to meeting that unequivocally. The Honourable Member for Richmond on his final supplementary. Well, once again, Mr. Speaker, rather than leading and working with police departments of offering new training and new techniques, we see the Minister saying, we're ready to follow. So you bring forward your proposals and then we'll make the decision at that point. Mr. Speaker, we have heard that from police departments for the fact that this province used to be a leader through the Department of Justice of working with municipal police forces of ensuring that training was up to standards. Yet over the last number of years, that has been cut and instead we hear the Minister of Justice saying, come ask for money. We don't have any thoughts on how additional training could take place. But if the minister is saying that all of this money is still waiting there, will he stand in his place and confirm that his department has not rejected any applications from municipal police forces for additional training in the last three fiscal years? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you. Uh, unlike the opposition, I have faith and respect for the leadership within the policing community. I also believe that if they have needs, that, that the direction of policing should come from the frontline management to determine their needs and assessment and that there should be a direct partnership and collaboration with justice. I don't believe that the politician should direct the police officer as to what their needs or needs aren't there. We work in partnership and in that direct collaboration and I'm very honoured to work in that. I also want to just say that, that as a province uh, we're connected with the community college, with the universities, we're connected with the Atlantic Police Academy, we're in direct uh, dialogue. In fact, I spoke with the director of the police academy the other day and he assured me that the partnership between the police agencies here and his agency that deliver the standard of service is, is of the first and best quality in the country. We have high standards, we maintain that, and there's more work that needs to be done and we believe in working in that partnership, unlike the Liberals who do not support the police. The Honourable Member for Glakes Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Northern Pulp is an important economic engine for the Pictou region, and it's good to see that they are looking at expansion and diversification. 
However, there are some valid questions surrounding the effect of the government's investment on the Pictou private sector. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier describe the impact this funding will have on the local economy and small forestry operations in the region? The Honourable the Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, it's uh, like this. Uh, the, uh, the investments uh, are intended to create uh, additional jobs, are intended, of course, to ensure uh, that uh, Northern are able to meet its responsibilities with respect to uh, the environment. Uh, it also uh, is intended that they will be able to be continue to be competitive, which of course is the key component because if not, uh, they would close and closing would mean that uh, all of the suppliers to that uh, plant uh, would go out of business. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A story published in the Herald on Saturday describes the consequences that the direct involvement will have uh, government public dollar involvement will have on ENR Langell Contracting Limited of New Glasgow. Their 34-year-old forestry operation employs 84 people, but because of the, the direct investment and involvement, they will be forced into letting close to 20 people go and will obviously lose revenue as well. In addition, the company has been denied go government support via loans based on the fact that would create an unfair advantage, but it seems as though the government has now put them at somewhat of a disadvantage. So I'll ask the Premier. What consultations and analysis did the Premier do to understand the impact on his funding to the local economy prior to making this decision? The Honourable the Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we uh, look at all aspects of any investment are made. We want them to have a net impact that is positive. Uh, obviously, um, uh, in this case, uh, some of the work will be co go in-house, which will make, them, make Northern more competitive, better able to supply uh, their markets. If that doesn't happen, they close, and not only does uh, ER Langell lose uh, that, but any other contracts uh, that they may have uh, with, uh, with uh, Northern as well, but my understanding is, is uh, that there uh, that there may well be additional work for ER Langell, and I'm uh, pleased to understand as of yesterday that they uh, were able to have uh, to enter into a contract uh, with. Um, uh, Port Hawkesbury paper and will be supplying um, uh, into Port Hawkesbury, uh, uh, I believe, uh, uh, with respect to uh, biomass. So hopefully that will alleviate uh, any uh, issues that they have, uh, that they have uh, accrued as a result of the change uh, in uh, uh, work at Northern. For Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, Northern Pulp is an important business for the region and their expansion certainly holds many positives. If the Premier had consulted with local businesses, he would have understood that this funding would have meant close to 20 job losses and revenue loss, and this, of course, was an unintended consequence. Mr. Speaker, yesterday during question period, in reply to the leader of the third party, the Premier responded to a question by saying, quote, if, uh, it's about government investing money that makes a return for the province, returns in two ways. One, a return in tax revenue that comes back to the province, and secondly, an investment that yields new jobs for the province of Nova Scotia." End quote. And the Premier did uh, mention in an earlier response that the intended, the, the, the uh, idea was that they would create new net jobs. So Mr. Speaker, keeping in mind the story of ENR Langell, can the Premier explain how his decision is adding new revenue and creating new jobs in Pictou County? Honourable the Premier. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I believe the answer to that is obvious, but I'll explain it to the, the, to the member opposite. Um, in order for companies to continue to operate, they have to be uh, competitive in their markets. If they're not, they continue to lose money, they close. The some 2,700 suppliers who supply those plants then either have to find work somewhere else, or they simply go out of uh, they simply go out of business. So supporting a company through productivity and competitiveness uh, um, uh, uh, measures that uh, that allow them to operate more efficiently uh, is uh, an important part of what we do. In fact. Uh, I believe there's some 1,400 productivity incentive uh, um, uh, grants and, uh, and initiatives that have been taken over the last uh, number of years in order to allow our, uh, our, um, 
uh, our businesses to get a bigger part uh, of the competitive market. Uh, that is the case here. That increases the uh, revenue uh, into the local economy, creates good long-term jobs. In this case, I believe it will create uh, somewhere in the vicinity of additional 20 jobs um, uh, directly uh, at, uh, at Northern. Uh, and um, as I said, I believe that with respect to Langell, they have the opportunity to continue to work at Northern, but also uh, now I believe also have a, uh, uh, also have a contract with uh, Port Hospital Paper. The Honourable Member for Richmond. Mr. Speaker, the Executive Director of the Nova Scotia Chapter of the Canadian Oil Heat Association recently informed members that the Nova Scotia Department of the Environment is close to approving funding for a residential oil tank rebate program. This program would offer a $200 rebate to replace your oil tank with a potential additional $50 from the members of the Canadian Oil Heat Association. My question is, will the Minister of Environment advise the House whether his department will be funding an oil tank rebate program this fiscal year? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. To the member opposite, he raises a very important question. I know that there's literally thousands of oil tanks. There's something that all these proposals will take under consideration. If there's anything that we can do to improve the environment, I think our record speaks for itself. We'll evaluate any proposal that comes forward. And the member opposite raised a very important question, uh, nationally safeguarding the environment. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Richmond on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, AFL Tank Manufacturing is an oil tank manufacturing facility that specializes in double-bottom steel tanks. AFL employs 14 to 15 tradespeople and is an important employer in Richmond County. Needless to say, AFL was surprised to learn that the proposed NDP oil tank rebate program would apply to non-metallic oil tanks only. Mr. Speaker, this would deal a debt blow to this business and others who are in the steel oil tank industry. Now, my question is, will the Minister of Environment advise when his government decided that they were opposed to double-bottom steel oil tanks for residential use in our province? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and to the member opposite. The member opposite, again, raises a very important question, something that's got my attention, and I can tell you that uh, regarding oil tanks, I know that there's literally thousands across Nova Scotia, and we are, any time that we have an opportunity to review and look at any time that we can save and protect the environment and also protect seniors and people who uh, probably of... Uh, in, in our society that can uh, actually uh, benefit from these programs is something that's caught my attention. And I can tell you that uh, this is on my radar and I'll take all the time to uh, seriously consider it. Thank you for the question. The Honourable Member for Richmond on his final supplementary. You know, the easy answer and all of that, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Minister, to say we fully support double bottom steel oil tanks and we support AFL and we support the men and women who work for that business and we don't want to do anything or implement any program that would somehow put this business in jeopardy, especially a business that's uh, surviving in rural Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, like many Nova Scotians, I have a double bottom steel oil tank at my house. Uh, I've, I've replaced the previous one, which was a double bottom steel oil tank before from AFL. This government has already proven that they do not support steel oil tanks because they already had the Environment Home Assessment Program, which was for low-income homeowners to install and replace their oil tank. That program did not allow uh, any steel tanks to be as part of that program. That ended in March 2013. So the government has already expressed that it does not support steel oil tanks for Nova Scotians and residential use. So my question to the minister, will he confirm today whether or not his government and his department supports the use of double bottom steel oil tanks for residential use in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you very much, and to the member opposite, I guess, the, I, first of all, I want to uh, make sure the member opposite and all members of this House, this is something that's on my radar, and it's very important to me because I know that the cost of uh, uh, replacing oil tanks across Nova Scotia, especially to uh, the most vulnerable, our seniors, and actually I picture my, my father painting his on an annual basis to make sure 
that that would last and protect the environment, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you that this is something that's very important to me and the member opposite that, the, first of all, that we're here to support the environment, to make sure that these are installed right and is done right, Mr. Speaker. That is the commitment that we have, and we'll look at any proposal favorably, and we'll, we'll take the time to consider it in all due respect. Thank you for the question. The Honourable Member for Kings West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, three years ago last month, legislation was passed by all members of the legislature around expanding the scope of practice for pharmacists. Included in this scope were changes that would allow pharmacists to administer flu vaccines. These changes were welcomed by all members of the House, and according to the words of the Minister today, this was good for patients and creates efficiencies in the health care system. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Health, could he please tell us why, after debating this bill in the 20th and session of the legislature, why a pharmacist was still unable to administer a flu vaccine this past flu season? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're working extremely hard to ensure that all clinicians around the province can work to their full scope of practice. We uh, recognize uh, the importance of pharmacists uh, to the healthcare system, and we've been working with them uh, and negotiating with them, uh, with PANS. Uh, interesting enough, I'm sure the member will be with, uh, with them later this evening at the reception. We've been working with PANS to come up with an agreement to uh, uh, ensure that there's compensation for pharmacists when they enter into providing that service for Nova Scotians, and, uh, and I look forward to them participating in the upcoming uh, flu season uh, by providing vaccines for Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Kings West on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, pharmacists provide valuable services to our communities, and the Fair Drug Pricing Act was passed in this House, which required pharmacists to cut back out of necessity on services they were providing to the public especially valuable services to our seniors. Changes to the Pharmacy Act in 2010 provided an opportunity to replace these services with other services which in 2010 would, in the words of the Minister, create efficiencies in the health care system. Could the Minister please tell us why this taken his department three years to come up with regulations that would expand the scope of practice for pharmacists? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We respect all the pharmacists uh, across the province and the work that they do uh, providing services for Nova Scotians, especially in rural communities, Mr. Speaker. We know uh, that over the last number of years, we've worked extremely hard uh, to ensure that we can maintain uh, a good health care system providing the services, Mr. Speaker. And I have to say, uh, with the work that the former uh, Minister of Health has done and the work that I've done in the in the last year around uh, pharmaceutical costs. Uh, we want to ensure that Nova Scotians, as seniors, all Nova Scotians are able to gain access to the medications they need, Mr. Speaker. Part of that is through capping uh, six generic drugs that we've worked across Canada on, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to implementing that, but also look forward to uh, looking and working with the pharmacists to ensure that they can practice to their full scope of, scope of care, Mr. Speaker, so that they can provide additional services so that their business plan can change to ensure that they can meet the needs of Nova Scotians within their pharmacies across the province. The Honourable Member for Kings West on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our caucus truly values the powerful role that pharmacists can play in our health care system. Pharmacists across this province have had to uh, ensure a lot under this government. They've had to cut back on clinics. They were forced to reduce staff. And a few are now in a position, very few are in a position to offer summer work to pharmacy students. Could the minister please indicate whether his department has consulted with pharmacists for the purpose of stepping up to the plate and addressing the gaps that were created as a result of the NDP government's legislation? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, it's under the NDP government that pharmacists will be allowed to give injections to Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. It wasn't under a former Liberal government. It wasn't under a former Conservative government, Mr. Speaker. It's this government that respects all clinicians, including pharmacists in this province, Mr. Speaker. And we're working hard to ensure that fair drug prices to all, for all Nova Scotians. And we're going to work with the pharmacies across the province, Mr. Speaker. But I don't know about the member opposite, but I know that I've traveled a lot in the province over the last year or so, Mr. Speaker. And there's a lot of pharmacists investing a lot of money in renovations and opening 
new pharmacies across the province, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to work, continuing to work with them. I meet with the Pharmacy Association Nova Scotia on a regular basis. I'm in contact with the past president of the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia. I'm in contact with the current uh, president of the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. That's how you move forward in changing models of care, Mr. Speaker, working with clinicians like pharmacists in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Argyle. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the government is allowing Capital Health to unfairly discriminate against small business owners, providing blood collection services to elderly and vulnerable people in their homes. The coming changes will require all blood samples to be transported to the McKenzie Building in Halifax within 90 minutes. The small business owners, often working in Coal Harbour or Sackville or Dartmouth and throughout the HRM, require them to cover costs of a courier to Halifax unfairly discriminates against those living outside the city centre. So why is the Minister allowing, or the Minister of Health allowing Capital Health to ignore vulnerable patients who live outside the city? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. M Mr. Speaker, what we're ensuring is that Nova Scotians can gain access to the tests they, uh, when and where they need it, Mr. Speaker. There has been an increase of over 25% of private companies that do blood collections across uh, Capital Health and across the province. One of the things we needed to do was to invest in technology, in equipment, Mr. Speaker, to provide the test and do the test in a timely manner. So we have a central centralized area in the McKenzie building that will do the, these tests, Mr. Speaker, to allow those outlying areas like the Cobb Good Centre, like the Dartmouth General, to provide the services for patients who are in that facility, Mr. Speaker. We know that we need to ensure that those tests get to the facility in, on, in, in the McKenzie building on, a, on in an appropriate time, Mr. Speaker. I don't understand why the, the member would allow for a private company to drop off Draw, uh, blood services at a, at a facility that would require us then to transport it to Halifax. What we're saying, we're coming out with clear guidelines. They all understand them, Mr. Speaker, and I think uh, it'll be best to serve Nova Scotians to ensure that those guidelines and those standards are in place. The Honourable Member for Argyle on his first supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, in, in the time that it takes to get it in is the is the challenge that they have. Uh, small business owners will have to nearly double their fees uh, to cover the cost of a courier because they need to now get a courier rather than bring it in themselves. Uh, the patients will have their blood collected in the safety of their homes. Uh, are vulnerable. One small blood collection business performed more than 800 in-home sample collections last year alone. We have an aging population and the need will continue to grow. Most patients, uh, most of these patients cannot afford to be charged uh, double the cost, but nearly all the patients are unable to lose, leave their home to travel to a clinic. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister, why does the Minister, or what does he say to those vulnerable, bedridden individuals who cannot afford to pay for the tests that they depend on for their health? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to be very clear uh, to Nova Scotians and the Minister opposite. We, the government, uh, is not charging individuals. These are private companies. We've seen a large increase in them over the last uh, number of years, Mr. Speaker, we're charging patients. We do not charge for blood collections when people uh, go into Cobbicut Center or the Dartmouth General. We know that we have to ensure that we can have continuity when it comes to the tests. All we're asking is if a private company decides to get into this business, that they follow the guidelines and the protocols that are in place, that they should be responsible on getting that uh, collection to the appropriate uh, facility, Mr. Speaker, and that's what's in the guidelines. Any current uh, private company that has a contract with Capital District Health Authority will be able to continue to drop off those specimens in Cobbicwood and Dartmouth General for the next year. We're going to give them, allow them to adjust their business model so that they can provide the services to Nova Scotians. But we have to have guidelines and, and, and gu in place, Mr. Speaker, to ensure uh, that, that when the test is done, it's done uh, in the appropriate way, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle on his final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, and I thank the Minister for, for that answer. Um, last week, the Minister told reporters that it was up to the small business owners to transition to uh, new business models to adapt to the inevitable change. Uh, once he was done trivializing the roles of these small businesses, he mused about the possibility of capital health, seizing the opportunity to collect blood samples from people at home. Not only does the Minister, uh, you know, I'm not going to 
their, doesn't really care about their fixed budgets or that they live outside the, the, the city, but now he's entertaining the idea of maybe putting those small businesses uh, out of work completely. So will the minister do the right thing and allow these companies to drop off their samples at the local capital health facilities for transport and protect vulnerable Nova Scotians from gougery at the hand of government? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing is we're in place, putting in place protocols that will ensure that if someone decides on their own to pay a private company to take their blood, Mr. Speaker, that that blood specimen is in the facility in the appropriate timeline. We have a large percentage of those blood collection samples that have to be retaken, uh, Mr. Speaker, because of a time lapse, because not appropriate amount of blood was taken, Mr. Speaker. So we need to have guidelines in place to ensure uh, that if someone chooses to utilize these private companies, uh, that those specimens are done and the tests are done in an appropriate way. We I've agreed uh, with Capital Health that the guidelines need to be in place. That's why they're allowing a timeline of about a year now so that these private companies need to ensure that they conform to the new regulations next April. Uh, and I hope that the, uh, the businesses uh, recognize the importance of doing that to ensuring the tests that they're uh, providing uh, Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Kings West. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on March 28, the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse, in collaboration with the National Advisory Council on Prescription Drug Misuse, released a national strategy to address the harms associated with prescription drugs. This strategy, titled First Do No Harm, was developed with uh, two uh, Nova Scotians from the Department of Health and Wellness, as well as the Kentville Police Chief Mark Mander on the team. And it laid out a comprehensive five-point plan to deal with the issue of prescription drug abuse and misuse. Could the Minister of Health and Wellness tell us whether his department plans to proceed with the implementation of this strategy? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm disturbed by the ca cases of uh, prescription drugs that we've seen in the, in the province. I think all Nova Scotians, all members of the House, uh, want to ensure that we don't see that happen in our province. I've met with, uh, with Chief Mander recently uh, to discuss some of the initiatives that we've undertaken over the last number of months and uh, or number of years, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I hope that the actions that we have taken has made a positive impact uh, to those individuals throughout the province who find themselves uh, addicted to prescription drugs, Mr. Speaker. We uh, have introduced a number of changes in models of care, for example, in addiction services, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that Nova Scotians get access to programs, uh, that they can have the support they need in the communities they, they live, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to move forward in trying to curb uh, the instances of prescription drug abuse. Uh, here in the province. The Honourable Member for Kings West on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, this is a comprehensive 10-year uh, uh, pan-Canadian strategy and it has significant recommendations around issues like prevention, education, treatment, monitoring and surveillance and enforcement. Mr. Speaker, it's a multifaceted problem that requires all hands on deck to deal with the issue of addictions and deaths related to opiates, sedatives, tranquilizers and stimulants. Could the minister please tell us whether he intends to ensure that all of the recommendations are addressed here in Nova Scotia or will he pick just certain measures? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member opposite for the question because I know uh, he has concerns, has been concerns in the communities that he represents in, in the Valley, but this is something that uh, I think all jurisdictions have been struggling with, Mr. Speaker. We talk about this as we meet uh, as Ministers of Health across the country, and for the first time in Canada's history, uh, we do have a new national strategy uh, to tackle prescription drug abuse, Mr. Speaker. That's why uh, we're moving forward with uh, uh, working with our partners in law enforcement and in the district health authorities uh, to act and, and are actively working on prescription drug abuse, Mr. Speaker. We've ex expanded uh, programs and our network of opiate replacement treatment programs in the Valley. We've trained more doctors uh, to responsibly dispense methadone, for example, Mr. Speaker. We've ran public awareness TV campaigns, not only as a province, but nationally. Different organizations have taken that on, Mr. Speaker. And it's mostly aimed at, at youth because we know uh, the dangers, especially of mixing out uh, prescription uh, drugs and alcohol, Mr. Speaker. So we're going to continue to move forward. 
Uh, we're moving forward on the prescription drug monitoring program, something that was expanded uh, well over a year ago to 24-hour, 24/7 access for our law enforcement, for our pharmacists, for our physicians, Mr. Speaker, all in the attempt to curb uh, the prescription drug abuse that we've seen in our province, something that has been happening across uh, Canada, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government has announced that early years centres will, quote, provide support for young children in the early years from birth to age six and their families, facilitating a seamless access to regulated child care, early learning pro programs, early intervention, before and after school care, parent education, child development programs, and other supports, unquote. And I'll table that. Can the minister? of Community Services, please tell the members of the House what services she expects the new early years centres to deliver that are different from services already being offered from family resource centres across the province. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the early years is very important to this government because we're the first government that it has developed an early years development strategy. And that hasn't been done by any other government in this province. And it is something that the people of Nova Scotia has been asking for. And what we will be doing is working with all those stakeholders, including the family resource centers that offer very valuable services within our communities. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove on her first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are 23 family resource centers across the province that deliver these very services that are critical to families. Some examples of their services include screening tools and prenatal support at the Dartmouth Family Center. I'll table that. Support for children from birth to six years old at Queens County Family Resource Center. I'll table that. A school readiness preschool program at the Bears Westwood Family Resource Center. I'll table that. Health and wellness programs, advocacy referrals, public health services and mental health workshops at Parent and Taught Family Resource Centre in Fairview, and I'll table that just to name a few. Can the Minister tell those family resource centres and the families that rely on their services what increase in funding they will see given this government's newfound interest in the early years? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, firstly, the Honourable Member is not telling me anything I do not know because I know the importance of family resource centers and the services that they offer and this is not a newfound interest of ours they do not understand the part about consultation and also including uh, strategically planning and developing a good plan to go forward and that's exactly what we're doing and the family resource centers will be a part of those discussions thank you the Honourable Member for Bedford Birch Cove on her final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the truth is family resource centres have not seen an increase in funding in 10 years. Oh, nice interest. Years. The 23 centres across this province only see a total of $2 million annually. When this government held consultations last year, family resource centres made it clear they are starved for funding and they already offer the community-based services being proposed through the early years centres. Why is it that this minister is starving services that are already in place like early intervention and now family resource centers for the sake of the government's electioneering. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, since it's question period, I would like to know from the Honourable Member why did the federal Liberals set up the family resource centers and then cut them loose with no funding so the provinces could step in? May she answer that question? And the Honourable Member for Kings West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, recently, uh, rare virus has uh, withered early strawberry crops in some parts of Nova Scotia. Farmers are cutting down thousands of the plants in the Great Village area in an attempt to destroy every trace of the aphids food source. Mr. Speaker, it's a very costly process for producers, and two markets will be affected by the virus. Plants which are mostly exported to the United States 
and those that are planted locally. My question to the Minister of Agriculture, Sugar what is government uh, planning to do to help these berry farmers at present? The Honourable Minister of Agri Agriculture. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I've met with the uh, the four uh, major producers uh, in the uh, in the divert area. Um, we had a, uh, a good discussion around uh, the, the issue at hand for them and, and what their steps uh, in due diligence of, of what they need to do to uh, eliminate the, uh, the virus complex that they're, uh, that they're dealing with. Um, so, uh, and I, uh, I just sent correspondence back to them because they kind of outlined some things they wanted to see the, the minister do, so, so I've done that. Um, but uh, anyway, their, their major request was that the, uh, the province uh, approach the federal government um, on the uh, agri recovery program. Uh, this is the only uh, one of four programs that uh, actually uh, they really need the help of the government to, uh, to uh, initiate uh, contact. What we needed from them was uh, some indication of the impacts on, on their farms so that we could make that application uh, to the federal government. And uh, so I'll just look forward to the minister's uh, or the member's further questions to give them more detail. The Honourable Member for Kings West on his first supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the loss of crops will affect hundreds of other local and migrant workers in the industry. It will cost producers an estimated $4 million. Now, this is really a, a once-in-a-century in a type of uh, virus that has occurred. Mr. Speaker, the real concern is if the federal money doesn't come through in time to help these producers, what steps is government prepared to make to compensate, help these farmers, which is described, as I said, once-in-a-hundred-year event? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the problem uh, that they've run into is actually the union of two viruses that have, have caused the problem. Either one of those viruses on their own would not, would not, have, uh, would not have happened. Um, and uh, so the, the three uh, programs that they could apply for themselves uh, are uh, AgriStability, AgriInsurance, and, and uh, AgriInvest. And I indicated earlier in the earlier uh, response that uh, AgriRecovery is the one that we would apply to the, to the federal government for. Uh, the uh, one thing that those, uh, th those individuals can do under uh, AgriStability would be to apply for an advance payment. So that gives them money, uh, which, which a number of, number of producers use quite often to uh, help initiate getting their crop in, and then they pay that off at the end of the season when they, when they harvest. So this is an option that they have right now. They can have money accessible to them through that program to help them get, get uh, their crop underway to, uh, to dispense of the, of the old plants and, and get on the way to uh, eradicating the virus on their farms, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, more families in this province are struggling under this NDP government. As of January 31st of this year, there were 2,412 seniors waiting for long-term care in this province. The wait list has increased more than 50 percent since this government took power. Will the minister give seniors a straight answer today and tell them just when we can expect new long-term care beds to be tendered? There we go. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look forward and, and I'm waiting anxiously for the questions uh, around the budget uh, once I get up in estimates, uh, hopefully tomorrow or maybe Friday, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to long-term care, uh, facilities, Mr. Speaker, and support for seniors for not only long-term care but home care, Mr. Speaker. It's this government that are, is moving forward to ensure that seniors get the services they need. Long-term care beds are important to seniors, Mr. Speaker, but the seniors that I talk to have been advocating and implying that they want to stay in their homes as long as they can, Mr. Speaker. Long-term care facilities should be a last resort for individuals, Mr. Speaker, and we know that. And I have to say, within the province of Nova Scotia, uh, we have one of the highest per capita bed ratios uh, ac from across the country, Mr. Speaker. So when you notice an increase, and I, I will, uh, will uh, identify an increase in the long-term care wait list, there's something wrong, Mr. Speaker. And what was wrong 
was that many of those people on that wait list did not gain access to home care services, Mr. Speaker. That's why we invested an additional $22 million last year. That's why we're additional, we, we have an additional millions of dollars this year in the home care budget, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to those questions and his second question. The Honourable Member for Argyle on his first supplementary. Now, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do look forward to asking him questions in, in estimate, but there's two things there, is that I don't make the list, and actually we're making a wait, like a lot of people are, may, are waiting uh, for long-term care in the province. Uh, on January 9, 2013, the Department of Health and Wellness came before public accounts. At that time, the Deputy Minister mused at the wait list for long-term care is so long because seniors sign up early for nice facilities, and I will table that. However, the department's own long-term care policy manual states that it is the continuing care coordinator who performs the assessment to determine whether the individual's request is appropriate for home care or long-term care placement, and I will table that as well. Is it not accurate or nor appropriate to suggest that seniors are signing themselves up for a nice place. It is the department that assesses, it is the department that has de deemed home care inappropriate for 2,412 seniors. When will the minister stop blaming these families for their weight and finally address the growing problem? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I am not blaming uh, the families, Mr. Speaker. I'm blaming the in inaction of the former Conservative government for 10 years, Mr. Speaker. They brought forward uh, a program to build new long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker. But one, one of the things they forgot, one of the things they forgot was to allow Nova Scotians to remain in their homes longer, Mr. Speaker. They didn't invest enough in home care services, Mr. Speaker. Over 40 percent, 40 percent of the long -term, those on long-term care have an, access, have an access home care, Mr. Speaker. That's a failure of the previous government, something that we're correcting. Order, here. order, please.